During Advent, we recall God's promises spoken through the prophets. To the hurting, God promises unshakable hope. To the forsaken, God promises unconditional love. To the broken, God promises unmerited grace. To the heavy hearted, God promises unbridled joy. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All the people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He, shall, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Our second reading is from 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. But do not forget the, this one thing, dear friends. With the, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. The word of God for the people of God. Be the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was John's message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whom sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of the Lord. 
Please be seated. We'll begin our time together here in prayer. Lord God, we are grateful for the gift of your words which are before us. And in this season of waiting, as we expectantly wait your second coming and remember your first, we pray that you would help us wait, hope-filled, with joy, understanding that you are a God who loves us and cares for us deeply. You're a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. Lord, we pray then the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, Benjamin Franklin once said, there is nothing certain except death and taxes. But I would like to ratify that, if that's okay with you. <laughs> it, maybe it's a bit precocious to ratify a statement, quote by Benjamin Franklin, but maybe it's okay if it's true. I would ratify that statement to say nothing is certain except death, taxes, and waiting. Are you with me on that one? Because guess what? We all wait. Waiting is a part of life. And I don't know how you feel about waiting, but I can sum up my thoughts and feelings and experience in waiting with two words. Waiting stinks. That's it. I do not like to wait. But you know, we get a choice in our waiting. We can wait patiently or we can wait impatiently. And how we, make, how we wait makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Mahatma Gandhi once said, to lose patience is to lose the battle. An unknown author once said, patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting. When we are impatient in our waiting, according to Gandhi, we lose that battle. And so as we're remembering and celebrating the first advent, that is the first coming of Christ, and as we look forward to the next advent, the next coming of Christ, we're waiting between advents. So how will you wait? How are you already waiting? I think in our Isaiah text to God's people, therein we have Isaiah prophesying, that is giving word of God to his people. And I find here that there are four encouragements or four encouraging reasons that we might wait patiently. So if you have your Bibles, follow along. If you want to grab a pew Bible, we're in Isaiah, of course, the 40th chapter. We heard this read for us, and in verses 1 and 2, there's a great shift in the book. Chapter 40 of Isaiah is a significant paradigm shift in how and what Isaiah is prophesying. So I'll read that for us. The first two words that we find that Isaiah proclaims to the people, and remember, the prophet or a prophet is simply defined as God's mouthpiece. So these now are the words of God, and the first two words are generous and kind and loving. Do you see those words? What are they? With me. Comfort, comfort. Comfort, comfort, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Now, if you've done any reading in Isaiah at all through the years, you will know that this is a shocking encouragement of God to the people through Isaiah. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. In fact, the hearer 
who opens chapter 40 might think to themselves after reading verses or chapters 1 through 39, like, is this a new book? Is this a new revelation? Is this a new Isaiah? Is this a new God? Comfort, comfort. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and then proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. We might read these two verses and think to ourselves, isn't this the New Testament we're in now? This doesn't have that flavor of the Old Testament, does it? But the beginning of chapter 40, God is now speaking to his people in love. Through chapter 39, the major theme and thrust of the book thus far, the prophetic uh, message has been a message of rebuke and criticism of the people of Israel. They are continued to be tempted by the nations around them and they have subsequently fallen into that temptation. But now God wants to encourage them. And frankly, I don't know why the shift. I don't know why chapter 40 moves from a God who is rebuking, a God who is judging, to a God who is now full of grace and love and comfort. I don't know why, but I'm glad to see it. And I hope you're glad to see it too. You're certainly not as happy to see it as the people of Israel in the time of Isaiah. You can almost imagine the big exhale. (sighs) Finally, we're going to get to some good stuff. You see, Isaiah in chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10 sums up the first 39 chapters. And and let me ask you as I read it to think to yourself, how many, it'll be a number, warm and fuzzies do you get from this text? You with me? You listening with that? How many warm and fuzzies will I get from this text? Go and tell the people, God says to Isaiah, listen hard, but you're not going to get it. Look hard, but you won't catch on. Make these people blockheads. (laughs) I love Eugene's, Eugene Peterson's message, blockheads. I love I can relate to that. With fingers in their ears and blindfolds on their eyes, so they won't see a thing, they won't hear a word, they won't have a clue about what's going on, and yes, so they won't turn around and be made whole. Okay, you have a number in your mind? How many warm and fuzzies did you get? None, yeah, this is a, it's a goose egg. <laughs> no warm and fuzzies. And so far in the text from chapters 1 through 39, we've found that there are not many warm and fuzzies. But chapter 40 changes all things. The tone, comfort, comfort. The use of the feminine, Jerusalem. It helps us to see That God, to his people, is a lover. He does not, in the end, judge and condemn. You see, this lover, God, has not cast off his love, Jerusalem, Israel, but rather is drawing her to his loving embrace. I like to look at Isaiah as a love story. (laughs) A love between the creator of all things, the God of the universe, and his people. And it's far from what we might think. A God who is casting off, a God who is judging, a God who is a God of condemnation. But rather, no, this God says, Israel. Jesus, when he was in his earthly ministry, stood on the Mount of Olives and looked over Jerusalem. Do you remember this? And Jesus said about Jerusalem, 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 
How I have longed to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks. That's one of my favorite verses in all of scripture. This is the God we see. This is the God who laments for his people. This is the God who loves them, who reminds them that he is a God of restoration, not judgment. And so how do we wait? Some of us wait in fear of Christ's second return. I hope I'm good enough. I hope I get in. I hope I've done enough. This isn't patient waiting. This is fearful waiting. Be convinced this morning. You can't do it. <laughs> if you're asking the question, I hope I get in because of what I've done, the answer to that question, unfortunately for you, is you have not. <laughs> you can't do enough. You can't be enough. You can't earn salvation. And so be encouraged today that God is your lover, not your judge, and that God draws you into his loving embrace. Wait patiently. Wait hope filled. Number two, in verses three through five, we hear Isaiah say this, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. These next verses here help the hearer know why they will be comforted and loved. And yes, this is a text written before the first advent. And yes, this prefigures the first advent. But don't we wait the same as Israel waited before the first century? Don't we long for, I hope we long for Christ's return. It's not here now. We might think that God is saying to Israel, well, enough is enough. You've suffered over the years. You've had life very difficult. And you know what? Everything's going to be easy from now on. We might think to ourselves that they've been faithful to God, that in their suffering, They've been faithful enough to earn merit with God that God no longer is going to allow them to suffer. But these things are not true. As Isaiah writes, the captivity of Babylon is right around the corner. The Babylonians will come in. They will destroy Israel. They will depose most of the people and take them back into captivity just like Egypt. And so what is God saying here to us? We are being reminded in these verses that God is a personal God, and God intervenes on our behalf. One of the greatest, I would say, mistheologies or misunderstandings of God this day is deism. Deism would say that God is far off that God cares little about me. In fact, he may not even know me. But this text reminds us in our hope-filled waiting as we wait patiently that God has and God will and even now God is intervening on our behalf. You can't say about God that he has left the building because God is intimate God is close. Verse 3 here describes John the baptizer. Remember we heard then the, the gospel text from Mark? And what the baptizer says is what the prophet already and has first said, simply 
God is coming. God is coming. These are the words of the prophet Isaiah. These are the words of John the Baptist. God is coming. God is coming. But like Isaiah's time, like the first century, so it is true today. We wait for God's personal intervention. Isn't it hope filled <laughs> that we can wait knowing God is with us? That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. Number three here, Isaiah promises God's word surpasses human power. Now remember what we're talking about. We're talking about what gives us a reason or reasons to be waiting hope-filled patiently. The first reason was that God brings restoration, not judgment. The second reason is that God is personally intervening in our lives. This third reason reminds us that God's word has more power than human power. Now, I don't know about you, but I need to hear this word today. For we find that human power is really clipping at our heels, is it not? I don't think we find ourselves too far removed from the Israelites as Isaiah prophesies to them. Verse 6, a voice cries saying, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The gra grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Friends, in a time of history when God's people had the right to fear other nations, and look at the history of Israel. <laughs> when we think about it, it wasn't such a great deal to be chosen. <laughs> They're hurting. They're soon to be brought into captivity, ripped out of the land yet again. And yet they are being encouraged by Isaiah. And how about those of us who are God's people today, the church? I don't know about you, but I don't think we're going in the right direction <laughs> in terms of finding favor with the nations. But Isaiah reminds us that God is bigger than the boogeyman. Anybody watch VeggieTales? <laughs> Sing with me. God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Godzilla and the monsters on TV. Yes, God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's watching after you and me. Thank you. <laughs> Come on, people, live, watch Veggie Tales. get out there. <laughs> God is bigger than the boogeyman. When there's so much fear of governments and nations like we have today, people are running around scared, even God's people. Why? Why are we doing that? God will be faithful. Here, there's a word used, God's breath will blow on them. You see, humanity is no more than a grass or a flower that withers. These are insignificant things compared to God. Don't you think God can overcome those things? God's breath blows on them. Think of a, of a wind, of a rushing wind. In fact, in the Hebrew, the word is ruach. And ruach can mean wind or a rush of wind. It can also mean spirit. That's the word also used for God's spirit, ruach. It's, think literally, God's breath. 
will wither the grass and the flowers. Probably this would recall to memory in the hearer, here in the time of Isaiah, of the Hamsin wind. This is a hot, dry wind in the spring that would blow and turn the countryside brown in as little as 48 hours. And guess what? We know this wind. Don't we? We don't call this wind Hamsin. We call it what? The termination or Chinook, right? Wind. We know this wind. We, we know it. We can relate. Yes, God's breath, his ruach, he blows on his creation to wither the grass and the flowers. This helps us know that we can wait hope-filled. We know the end of the story. It's already been revealed to us. God wins. Lastly, then, we can wait with hope-filled expectation and patience, knowing that God, when he returns, brings both his sovereignty and his compassion. You see, that's the difference, I think, in the book of Isaiah, between the first 39 chapters and then chapter 40 as he begins anew. God is sovereign. We see his emphasis there in the first 39 chapters, and then we begin to see God's compassion. Comfort, comfort my people, Israel. Verse 9 through 11, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain you who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. God is coming. God is coming. Isaiah said it. God is coming. God is coming. John the Baptist said it. Here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and he rules with a mighty arm. But that's not the end of the story. His reward is with him. His recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. The good news, friends, is God is coming. But he's not just coming in judgment. He's coming in love. He's coming with grace. He's coming with redemption and forgiveness. He's coming as a mother hen longing to gather her chicks. And this is good news. This is the good news. This Advent, you get to choose how you wait. Christ is coming. <laughs> Will you wait patiently, hope-filled, trusting in Christ's promises? Or will you wait impatiently, without? The choice is yours. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.